in the last few weeks, you've heard me speak a lot about hurts and cravings, about hurts being the problems that we have that come from being human and therefore needing certain things and being frail and fragile and liable to experience harm in all sorts of different ways. And cravings, those things that are the opposite of our hurts, those things that we desire, that we want, that we want to have enough of, that we want more of, that we want to have forever. And that some of, our, some of the problems that we experience are because of those cravings going out of control and becoming obsessive to us that all we can think about is what we want that we don't have. And those hurts and cravings manifest themselves in different areas of our lives, um, different, different dimensions. One of the dimensions that we talked about last week when we were looking at the woman at the well in John 4 is the social dimension. In other words, our interactions with other people. That, that there are ways in our, in our relationships with other people, there are things that we naturally desire, that we crave in our relationships with other people, and we are hurt when those are violated or when those are withheld from us. Well, today what we're looking at is the, the um, hurts that we endure and the cravings that we feel that are physical. There are physical hurts that we suffer in our bodies and there are physical cravings that we have from our bodies. And of all the problems that we have, of all the hurts that we endure and the cravings that we feel, the physical ones are the most basic. They are, they are the most fundamental in what it means to be human. And they're also the most immediate. When, when we're hurt physically, we feel it right away. When we crave something physically, we feel it right away. And our physical hurts and cravings are the most demanding. They're the ones that, that, are, that when we're experiencing them, then any of the other of the problems that we might have seem to diminish greatly in comparison. You know, whatever our problems are in our relationships with other people or whatever our problems are in, um, in, in having meaning and purpose in life, whatever our problems are in how we think about ourselves, those problems all go away real quick when we experience significant physical hurt or a significant physical craving that's not satisfied. Now, the gospel that Christians proclaim is that Jesus is the solution to all of our problems. Jesus is the solution to every human problem, including our physical problems. Including our physical problems, Jesus himself, this man that we, that we read about here today, is the solution. He's the solution because Jesus himself is the healing and satisfaction, not the idols that we've made. As I've talked in earlier weeks, an idol is when you take a craving that you have and you make it into the thing that will save you. In other words, if I could just have this thing, if I could just have this benefit, if I could just have this good, then my life will be okay. Then I'll be happy. Then I'll be satisfied. Jesus himself is that healing and satisfaction. No matter what it is that we as human beings very legitimately want, no matter what we hurts we legitimately experience, like it really does hurt to, to be deprived of this or, or, or to be hurt by that, that nevertheless the things that we think are going to satisfy that are not what will ultimately satisfy. Jesus alone does. When we make anything else, put anything else in that place, that is what the Bible calls idolatry, making an idol, setting up a created thing at the level that the Creator alone is supposed to inhabit. But Jesus is the solution to our problems by being our healing and satisfaction and by making it possible to be forgiven of our idolatry, our choosing created things over and against our Creator, by dying on the cross, by rising from the dead, by ascending into heaven. By doing those things, Jesus brought about a way that we could be reconciled to the God that we said we need this rather than you so that our offense against him, that sin, could be done away with and we could be restored. We could be reconciled to him once more. 
And once that has happened, then Jesus is, is willing and able to give us a taste of healing and a taste of satisfaction right now in this current present life on this earth in answer to the prayers that we offer in his name by faith. But not only that, he also promises complete healing and complete satisfaction in the future to all those who believe in him, to all those who have faith in him. So Jesus is the solution to all our problems because he is the healing and satisfaction because he, can, he gives us a taste of that reality now as we ask him and because he gives us the whole thing in the future when he returns. Now John chapter 6 illustrates how demanding our physical problems are and how those physical problems that we have focus our minds on present earthly things. But John 6 also illustrates how Jesus is the solution to our physical problems if we raise our vision and we trust Him. And that if we trust Him, then those physical hurts that we have and the physical weaknesses that we have and the physical cravings that we have get, get ameliorated now and we can make it through until the time that He returns. So, first of all, as we're looking here at this text, the first issue that we see faced by the people is sickness. The first issue they have, the first hurt they have is sickness. Because see, in verse 2 it says, a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. So Jesus was, um, d- did most of his ministry in, uh, on the, the western side of this lake called the Sea of Galilee. And he got into a boat with his uh, 12 closest students, the 12 disciples. They also called the 12 apostles. And they went from the west side to the east side. And this huge crowd of people who had seen what he had done to heal sick people, where he would speak to them or lay hands on them, and people with disabilities um, had those disabilities removed. People with sicknesses were healed. People who were Um, harassed by demonic forces and had mental illness, had that thrown out of them, had that cast out of them, that, that, that they actually then walked around the lake like this to find him on the other side. Okay? This, a a large group of people, as we see later on here, it was 5,000 men, right? Plus their wives and kids. So this is thousands of people who were walking around to follow him. And why were they following him? Because they had sicknesses. And, and Jesus is healing people through the Gospels right and left, and it seems like no matter how many people he heals, there's still more people to be healed. Like, he just never runs out. I mean, there's constantly people around. Constantly people around who need to be healed. And so they're following him there. So they've got that physical issue, right? The hurt of sickness and the craving for health. All right? So they get there, so Jesus is going, and again, because this is a text that we see in all four Gospels, we see that the reason that Jesus went over is because, frankly, he was exhausted from all the people he was healing. He had been healing so many people that he was wiped. He was bushed, okay? And so he said to his disciples, like, we got to go. Like, we got to get out of here. Like, let's, we need a break, okay? We need a retreat. He goes and he gets to the other side, and and they settle in, and here the people come. You know, and, and Jesus' response to that, the, the, one of the amazing things about Jesus is that no matter how fatigued he got, his compassion was always greater than his fatigue, which just blows me away, frankly. I, I cannot relate to this. <laughs> I can't. But his compassion was always greater than his fatigue, always greater than how tired he was. So even though he's exhausted, he's like, all right, well, here they come, you know. So he starts to heal him and he starts to teach him. You know, he starts to lecture to them. He starts to talk to them about the kingdom of God that's coming. You know, so he's giving them partial healing now. You know, he's giving them healing now for their issues, but he's saying, you know, a time is coming in the future that there's going to be complete healing for all of your issues. So this happens, right? Well, the disciples are tired too. And so this goes on. This gets late. And we actually see in the other Gospels, the way it's written is like the disciples, the 12, come to Jesus and say, let's send these people away, you know, like, let, you know, the, the way they put it is, you know, it's getting late, we've got no food out here, send these people away so they can get something to eat, 
So it sort of looks like it's concern for the people. But kind of the undercurrent of this is that the disciples are like, let's just get rid of these people so we can have that little R&R that we thought we were going to have. But in John's version, John's version focuses on Jesus' initiative. So it's not written as the disciples coming to him. It's written as Jesus going to Philip, one of the twelve. So, um, and I don't think it's, it's contradictory, but it's a different emphasis or it's a different angle. Because as you can see here from John 6, it says in verse 5, When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus looks responsive. In um, John 6, Jesus looks proactive. So there's, there's a blend of the two that I think if we had actually been there and we read the two different versions, they would both seem accurate to us. It's only because we weren't there that they, don't, they, they seem kind of different. But, but again, the point that we have here is, that, is that, the, that the other issue that these people have is that they're hungry. You know? so, so physical hunger... <laughs> is a major, major problem. I mean, it is a fundamental physical problem. Like, if, if that's not working right, then nothing else is really going to work right in your life, okay? Physical hunger is a huge, huge deal. And so I'm, I'm very thankful that, um, you know, that, that we have in the bulletin that Carol mentioned about um, our opportunity to feed people, uh, and the, feed the hungry in our own area, because this is just absolutely fundamental. And this is something that Jesus really cares about. Jesus is not living on some plane where he doesn't care about very basic stuff like hunger. Jesus cares deeply about basic stuff like hunger. And so he sees this issue. The people have this issue of, of being hungry. And they have this craving to be filled up. And so we have this amazing miracle that we read about, that you know about, where Jesus takes um, one young person's five loaves, five little rolls, and, uh, and two little fish, and takes them, and it says in the gospel, he gave thanks. He said, have the people sit down, and he gave thanks, and he broke it, and, the more, and he gave it to his disciples for them to, to give pieces. And they kept coming back to him, and he kept giving more, and they kept coming back, and he kept giving more. And, and as all of this happens, okay, eventually everybody has enough to eat. And so much so that then he says to his disciples, make sure you pick all, up all the leftovers. We don't want to waste anything. You know, and so they go and they take these baskets and they get 12 big baskets full of the leftovers that came from the five loaves and the two fish. And, and what is going on in all of this is not only this incredible miracle, but there's also something that's happening underneath it. Okay? There's something happening underneath it where Jesus is speaking to them. He's actually showing them something about his superiority to what had come before. See, I want you to notice in verse 2 that it says, And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs that he had performed on the sick. Now, in the Gospel of John, the way John writes, whenever John talks about miracles, he always uses a word, signs. He doesn't call them miracles. There's, there's another word in Greek for miracles. He doesn't call them that. He calls them signs. Okay? Well, what's a sign? A sign is something that points to something else. A sign is something that, that points to something else as a symbol, as a marker, saying, you know, this is what this is. It's like a label or a direction, okay? So Jesus, when he was healing people, he was doing signs. They were signs that were pointing to a reality. And it says here in verse 2 that people saw the signs, okay? And if you look down in verse 14 after everybody eats it says after the people saw the miraculous sign that jesus did they began to say surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world and so they were picking up on something they're picking up on something real what was it that they were picking up well you might have noticed earlier on in verse 4 it says the jewish passover feast was near well why even mention that i mean why even bring it up right like what's like, what's the point? What difference does it make? Well, the difference that it makes is that there's this thing that's going on here with what Jesus is doing that he is redoing. He is like doing over again something really, really important that happened in the history of his people, Israel. When Israel 
in, in um, about you know, 1450 BC, something like that, when they were enslaved, the entire group of them, the, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, were enslaved in Egypt. Then God sent a guy named Moses to be the mes- his messenger to tell Pharaoh to let the people go. And God did these huge um, acts, these huge acts of devastation, these disasters and calamities on Egypt until finally the Egyptians let the people go. They went out into the desert on their way from Egypt to the land that God had promised their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And while they were in the wilderness, in the middle, they ran out of food. And so they didn't have food. So before they left, let me, let me rewind a little bit. Before they left Egypt, the very last thing on their very last night, they ate this meal called the Passover meal. It was called the Passover meal because on that night, the angel of death passed over the homes of the, of the Israelites and struck down and killed the firstborn male of all of the Egyptians. And that meal then, the, the people of Israel celebrated every year after that as a reminder of how God had brought them out of Egypt and slavery. And so Moses now is leading them in the desert. God is leading Moses to lead them through the desert. And as they're going through the desert on their way out, they get hungry. And what happens when they get hungry? They start grumbling to Moses and say, Moses, you brought us out here just to starve to death. Again, no matter what other problems are going on in your life, if you have an empty stomach for a few days, that becomes the problem in your life, right? And that's what happened to these people. And so Moses goes to God and says, God, you didn't prepare me for this. What am I supposed to do? And God says, don't worry, I'll take care of it. I'm going to send something called manna. And it's called manna because manna comes from the Hebrew word meaning, what is that? Okay, so so manna is a Hebrew way of saying, what's it? We should translate it, what's it? He gave them what's it out of heaven. And what it was is that that every night, um, you know, when dew would crystallize on the ground, when it would condense on the ground, then when it would evaporate, what would be left is this stuff. And you could gather up the stuff and you could make it into flour and you could make pancakes out of it. And so they called the stuff manna. And it came down six days a week. Didn't come down on the seventh day because that was the Sabbath. So you got twice as much on Friday and nothing on Saturday. And that, ca- that happened for 40 years. For 40 years while they were living in the desert. Six days a week. Here's the manna. And they ate it every day. Like, they ate manna flakes in the morning, right? They ate manna bread at lunch. I mean, they ate manna all day long, every day, for 40 years in the desert. And so all of that, right, is going on. Now, here in John chapter 6, what happens? The Passover feast is near. Jesus knows this. Jesus knows that people are thinking about it. And Jesus is about to demonstrate that he is superior to Moses. That Moses, the guy that they had, who had brought them out, okay, Jesus was superior to Moses. Because Jesus is giving them food, like Moses gave them food, and, and he's redoing everything that Moses did. Even little things like when he has them sit down in groups, okay? And, and you can actually see in, um, in, uh, in the other Gospels, you don't see it in, in this Gospel so much, but when they sit down when they're reclining, they're reclining as if they're sitting down at the Passover meal. Um, in, they sit down in groups of 50 to 100, which was similar to how they were organized when they were going through the wilderness. And uh, when they collect the baskets, they fill 12 baskets, 12 disciples, each with one basket, 12 baskets representing the 12 tribes of Israel, right? So all of this stuff happens. That He's doing this like Moses part two kind of thing. And then what do they say in verse 14? Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Well, who's the prophet who's to come into the world? Well, in the book of Deuteronomy, the, which, was the, which was Moses' final speech to the Israelites just before he died, he said, after me is coming a prophet and do whatever he says. Now, at one level, Moses was referring to just any of the prophets. There were lots of prophets who came after Moses that came from God, that were spokesmen from God, and people were to do whatever they said. But by Jesus' day, they believed that Moses wasn't just talking about the prophets in general, but one prophet in particular who was going to come. 
and they're looking at Jesus and saying, this is the guy, because he's doing the same thing that Moses does. All right? But then it says in verse 15, Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. So they see this guy they think is the prophet, and they're going to make him king. Why? Because they've got another physical problem, and that is the security problem. That is the safety problem, which is also related to the social problem of them being inferior to the strength and power of Rome that was in charge of them through client kings and governors at that time, and the, and the vocational problem of exploitation because their, a lot of their hard-earned wages were getting taken in taxes that were getting sent back across the Mediterranean Sea to Rome. And their problem of, uh, uh, and so, so those problems were also on them as well, okay? And so it's not only sickness is their problem, it's not only starvation is their problem, but safety is their problem. And they need a king to, to exercise justice and righteousness so that there would be peace and safety and everybody would be able to have the fruits of their labor rather than it being, you know, kind of ripped off of them, stolen from them by these foreigners who are in charge. So, because of all of this concern, when they wake up the next morning and Jesus isn't there because he walked across the water the night before, they go looking to find him. So they get in the boats and, that, that happen to show up and they go back over there. Other people are walking you know, back around the other way. And they find Jesus and they start talking to him and they start trying to find a way to convince Jesus to maybe to do that thing with the loaves and fishes again. Okay? To try to do that thing with the loaves and fishes again. And... And something that, that happens when people are hungry, and when they're hungry a lot, something that happens when people are used to living hand-to-mouth, they're used to living one day at a time, they don't know when they wake up in the morning whether they're going to have food to eat that day, is that for survival, they become very, very good at learning what is the thing that I need to say that cracks the code, that turns the key so that somebody who has what I need gives me what I need. And that's the dialogue. That's, that, that, seriously, this is, how, this is how it is. And maybe you yourself have, have, have done this. Maybe you have been on the, on, the, on the end of being hungry and of having to do this to survive. Or maybe you've had people come to you and to do that same thing. And that's what's going here. They say, Rabbi, when did you get here? You know, and then Jesus says something really interesting in verse 26. He says, I tell you the truth, you're looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs. Now wait a second, I thought that they did see the miraculous sign. I thought that we saw in verse 2 that they saw the miraculous sign of him healing. I thought that we saw in verse 14 that they saw the miraculous sign of Jesus, you know, feeding them. In fact, they ate the miraculous sign. But Jesus says, no, you're not here because you saw miraculous signs. You're not here because you saw the signs. You're here because you ate the loaves and had your fill. You're here because you were hungry, and then you got full, and now you're hungry again, and you want more. You saw that I could give you bread, but you didn't see the sign. Verse 27, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. So Jesus at this point makes a powerful suggestion He's suggesting that even though they saw the signs, they didn't see what the signs were really pointing to. I mean, they experienced some things. And they experienced enough to know that Jesus was something special. They experienced enough to know that Jesus was the prophet that Moses had promised, which is true. They had experienced enough to know that he was the rightful king of Israel, which was true. But they didn't see it enough to know the size of, the magnitude of what that meant. The size, the hugeness of what all Jesus intended to do to solve their problems. Because Jesus kicks it up a notch to say, all right, so hunger's a problem, I got that. Sickness is a problem, I got that. Safety and security are problems, I got that. But how about mortality? How about the fact that no matter how much food you, you have to eat, and no matter how much your sicknesses are healed, and no matter how much safety and security you have, you're going to die someday. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that problem. Let's talk about the physical problem of death. The physical problem of mortality. 
that cannot be avoided. That might get, you might be able to distract yourself from it. You might be able to try to make some meaning of it. You might be able to try to put it off, but eventually it's right there. And Jesus says, I'm here to give you immortality. I showed you that I have the power to, to meet your physical needs for a little while to prove to you that I have the power to meet your physical needs forever. And that's what this whole rest of the chapter is all about. The whole chapter is about living forever. That's what it's all about. Jesus says, um, when, when he does this back and forth, where the people say, um, you know, well, what should we do to do the works that God requires? You know, Jesus, just tell us what to do so that you'll give us bread again. Jesus says, it's to believe in the one he has sent. Okay, well, hmm, what miraculous sign will you give us so that we can see and believe you? Like, well, I don't know, Moses gave us manna. Maybe that might do it. You know, I mean, that's kind of the attitude here. You know, and Jesus is no dummy. He's not going to get suckered into that. Instead, he says, listen, I tell you the truth. It's not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven. It is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Verse 35, then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. And he goes on to describe that, that the, what he means by that is verse 39, this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For the Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. See, there's going to be a last day. There's going to be an end to history. There's going to be something that all of this that's been going on for, for however many years it's been going on, Will, will finally reach its terminus. It will reach its end. The train will get to the station. It will be the last day. And the door is open and the conductor says, everybody out. And, and what's going to happen at that last day is that Jesus returns and the graves open and the dead rise. Jesus says, um, prior to this, in, John, in the previous chapter, John chapter 5, some to a resurrection of, uh, of condemnation and others to a resurrection of eternal life. And the difference between the one and the other is whether you believe in Jesus. Whether you trust that He is the bread of life, that He is the one, that He is the source. But what's coming then is being raised up at the last day in a body that doesn't get hungry anymore. A body that doesn't get sick anymore. To live in a place where there is no lack of safety anymore. There is no violence. And there is no theft. And all of those things are settled forever and ever and ever. And that's what's there, that's what's coming, that's what Jesus is talking about. And Jesus is emphatic about this, that this is me. That eternal life is not like something I give to you, like it's something I send to you. It's me, myself. Right? It's like the difference between, you know, trying to order a, a great party in the mail versus inviting somebody to come to the party who just brings the party wherever they go. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that, that's what it is. You know, Jesus isn't somebody that you go to say, Jesus, I would like eternal life, please. Will you please give me this packet of, of eternal life that I can mix in, you know, put in a cup and mix in water and stir it around and drink it and then I'm fine. No. He is eternal life. It's Him. It's, it's being so intimately, spiritually tied to Him that you cannot but live. That you're connected to Him like the organs in your body are connected to one another and to the head. It's, it's being joined with him that way. First spiritually, and then physically, when he returns. In some way that we cannot even grasp, but is real and is true. That really is the full and final solution to all of our problems. That's who Jesus is. That's what Jesus is. Now, for much of the rest of this text, much of the rest of this story, we have Jesus talking at great length about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. Let's talk about that a little bit, okay? Let's not just skip that, pretend it's not there, okay? Obviously, as we're reading, that people had a problem with that. They're thinking, well, I liked eating bread, not so much into the cannibalism part, you know? Not really into that, that's not really my speed, that's not my thing. And a lot of people stopped following him because of that. 
And Jesus goes on and on and on and on and on about it. Well, there's a parallel to Jesus talking about that and what Jesus talks about in John 3. See, in John 3, he's having a conversation with a guy named Nicodemus. And in that conversation, he says a crazy thing like, you have to be born again, right? And Nicodemus is like, what? What does that mean? Am I supposed to climb back into my mother's womb and be born again? Like, how, how is this supposed to happen? Well, Jesus is using that. He's using this physical statement that's a physical impossibility as a, as a symbol for a spiritual reality. So it's the same sort of thing. It's using earthly physical terms to describe a heavenly spiritual thing. That's why Jesus says in, in verses uh, 62 and 63, he says, what if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? Back to heaven. He said the same sort of thing to Nicodemus back in chapter 3. The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. In other words, you've got to hear what I say about a physical fleshly reality and you've got to interpret that in a spiritual way because that's really what I'm talking about here. And yet, and so what Jesus is talking about when he says, eat me and drink my blood, is it's a way of describing faith in him and what happens when you have faith. So faith in him is like eating and drinking. And, um, or eating and drinking is like faith in him. And, and, never, and being full and never being hungry again is like what happens to you spiritually when you've believed in him. Right? You're not worried about the future anymore. You're not worried about what happens when you die anymore. You got that taken care of. Okay? And, and yet, um, and so that's why Jesus says in verse 40, for example, um, I'm sorry, in verse 47, he says, I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. Okay? So, so it's a way of describing faith. And yet, it is linked to a physical action. See, back in John 3, Jesus says to Nicodemus, that unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Well, being born of the Spirit means that your spirit has been transformed to live again by faith in Jesus. And the water part, different people think different things about it, but most likely what it means is being baptized. Okay? And now we have over here, well, you've got to eat me and drink me in order to have eternal life. Well, we know that's a spiritual thing. That means that you're trusting Jesus for life from now on. But it's also linked to this physical thing that we're about to do called the Lord's Supper. Where we eat bread that Jesus said, this is my body. And we drink um, from a cup that Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant. Okay? Now, this has caused Christians great questions for much time. And the, and the position of some Christians, notably Roman Catholics, is that, that, the, that the water, when you get baptized, that the water really saves you. The water itself saves you. Okay? By what God does with the water, it really saves you. And, when you. and when you eat the food, that's really Jesus' body that goes into your body. It's really Jesus' blood that goes into your body. Okay? And the Baptist perspective, and we're Baptist, this is a Baptist church, the Baptist perspective is, well, no, you're saved by faith, and then the water comes after and it's just water. And you're saved by faith, but then you eat the bread and you drink the juice, and it's just bread and juice, and it's just to remember. And then you have other Christians who are somewhere in between those two polar opposites. Okay? Now, I'm a Baptist. I'm the pastor of a Baptist church. I hold to the Baptist position that the bread is bread, the juice is juice, the water is water. You know, it doesn't ha it's not supercharged in any crazy way. It doesn't go into some magical transformation or whatever. But I think it's a mistake to say it's only a symbol. Because frankly, we just don't even know that. We just don't know. What we do know is that God has made baptism and the Lord's Supper essential parts of having faith in Jesus. And he's made them essential parts of beginning to experience eternal life. So Jesus said to his disciples, take and eat, not take and understand. So we do it because he told us to do it. But here's what I'd like you to do right now because we're going to eat and drink in a moment. And what I'd like for you to do, I'd like you to be very much Baptist here. I'd like you to be very Baptist and believe that the bread is bread, and that the juice is juice, and it's not turning into Jesus' body and blood. But here's what I do want you to do. Let's really consciously, intentionally receive him by faith as we take that into our mouth. As you eat the bread, 
And as you feel yourself chewing it, as you feel it physically going down your esophagus into your stomach, I want you to say to yourself, Jesus satisfies. Jesus fills me up. Jesus sustains me and gives me my life. I want you, even though, even though the bread is bread, I want you just to pretend for a few seconds that it's Jesus. That you're taking in the person who is the one who really sustains your life. Because bread comes and goes. But Jesus really sustains your life. That you're taking in the one who really satisfies. Because there's lots of things in the world that promise to satisfy. But Jesus is the one who really satisfies. And as you drink that cup, I want you to think, as you feel the juice going, trickling down your esophagus and going and warming your stomach, I want you to think about Jesus' blood going into the deepest darkest, innermost parts of your soul to cleanse your sins. That there is no corner of your nature that his blood does not touch. That that, that the absolute center of what you are is made completely righteous, clean, holy, and forgiven by God because of the blood of Jesus shed on the cross. I want you to think that when you take that down. So even though we think the bread is bread and we think the juice is juice, let's have faith when we take it. And and let's make our faith physical by taking that. And if you've never had that faith in the first place, then instead of eating the bread and instead of taking the juice, I want you to pray that Jesus would save you from your sins and that you would be reconciled with God again. And let's talk after this and then maybe you'll eat and drink next time. Kelly, let's, uh, why don't you play for us?